Thank you. So, GraphQL, you might have heard of it by now. And if you have, you've probably heard things like how it's great for performance, great with backwards compatibility, great for the developer experience, and even great for those hard to get out stains. Probably. There's seemingly nothing GraphQL can't do. Uh, but have you ever wondered how? How is it GraphQL can have these supposed superpowers? And I think the key to this is lay in its basic building blocks. So in this talk, we'll start off with taking a look at the schema definition language, or SDL, and resolvers to better understand uh, how they work together to execute a query. Then I'll show some ways to use these features to graph all the things uh, before finally entering the uh, don't try this at home portion of the talk. Uh, but first, g'day, how's it going? <laughs> uh, I'm Michael. I'm a senior engineer at Redbubble on the platforms team, where we work on building tooling, services, and platforms to enable everyone at Redbubble. Uh, so karaoke enthusiast and the maintainer of LibSAS and NodeSAS. You can find me later and ask about your NPM install issues. Uh, so let's jump right into it. The schema is the skeleton of GraphQL. It's what gives it its shape. Everything else builds on top of or happens as a result of the schema. In GraphQL, schema is defined using the schema definition language. Uh, here we have an example schema. As you can see, we're using the keyword type to define a new type we've called conference. Uh, our conference type has a name field, which we've set as a string. String is one of the built-in scalar types in GraphQL. Uh, there are other things like ints, floats, and booleans, and all the usual suspects. Uh, next up, we have a speakers field, uh, which has an array of speaker type. The speaker type is not one of the built-in types, so we define it ourselves. Here we say our speaker has a name and a favorite emoji. Uh, this just gives me license for using emojis throughout the talk. Uh, next, notice we have some fields have exclamation marks and others do not. The absence of an exclamation mark just means this field can be omitted and is still valid. Uh, also note there are IDs. They're just for convenience when querying and mutating data. Um, speaking of querying and mutating data, uh, we have the query and mutation types. Uh, these are special types called root types. Uh, there are others too, but we're not going to talk about them today. On our query type, we have a conference field that returns any conferences we know about. We also have a speakers field that has a required emoji argument and returns some speakers. Uh, we have a mutation type. It has a speak field. It takes a speaker ID and a conference ID. Uh, something to note, it's just common to refer to fields on speakers and on query mutation types simply as queries and mutations. Uh, You'll also notice the return type of our mutation looks just like the re return type of a query field. A field on a mutation could just return things like Booleans, but these richer types are, are part of the expressiveness of GraphQL. There's some detail to how these are defined that we won't go into today. Uh, but the important thing to take away from this is the fields in the query type typically ask for information, whereas fields in mutation type typically change things. And uh, lastly, that the resulting data from mutation can be expected to have the changes already applied. Yeah. If schemas are the skeleton of GraphQL, resolvers are their beating heart. They bring life to GraphQL. With, uh, with all the amazing things GraphQL can do, you'd think they'd be pretty complicated. But actually, it's the simplicity of resolvers uh, that is the key to their flexibility. Resolver is just a function. It takes a couple arguments. We're only going to talk about these three today, uh, but there are others. And you can define a resolver for any or all fields on your schema. This includes fields in the query type, like the conferences field, fields on a mutation type, like the speak field, and fields on any type, like the emoji field on the speaker type. Inside a resolver, you can do anything you could do in any other JavaScript function. The only requirement is that it returns a value in the shape that matches the type of the field it's responsible for. Uh, here we have a map of resolvers. It has a query object representing the query type. Uh, and our query object, there is a speaker's resolver. A speaker's query has an emoji argument. We can access that argument by its name on the args argument in our resolver. Uh, we know from our schema that the speaker's query should return either nothing or an array of speaker types. Here, our speaker resolver is returning an array of objects. Those objects have an integer ID field, as well as the name and all important emoji string fields. Uh, this means they match the expected shape of the query, and all is well. Remember, the conference field on the speaker type 
doesn't have an exclamation mark, so it's entirely optional here. Um, our speaker mutation, here we have a speaker mutation. It's loading data from the, com from the context uh, by the conference ID argument. Context is a bit special. It's a shared global object for the lifetime of a request. This makes it useful for storing things like configuration or services like database connections. Uh, after the conference is loaded, uh, the speaker ID argument is appended to the conference object. The updated conference object is persisted before finally doing a query for the conferences that speaker is attending. Uh, right. So that was a lot. Uh, but it's just the groundwork for what's coming up next. Now we're going to take a look at some practical uses for resolvers to kind of give you a better feel of how they work together and really give the versatility to GraphQL. Uh, the simplest resolver is one that returns an object. Earlier we saw this resolver, and I said it was all good because it returned an array of objects that matched the shape of the speaker type. But how does GraphQL now, these objects, match the speaker shape? Is there some kind of internal validation engine or some form of introspection happening on the return type? Or is it just AI? GraphQL can do all these magical things, so why not throw a little AI in there? So no doubt there's a bunch of ways to validate these return types. Um, and if you're anything like me, you've been sitting there trying to think about how you would have done it yourself. But I've actually already shown you how it happens. Every field on GraphQL gets a default resolver. The default resolver is straightforward. For any field, it takes the object, uh, the parent object, and tries to either access a field as a function call or an object property on the parent. Importantly, this happens recursively. So if a field returns a type, uh, the, the field's return type is a custom type, then all the fields on that type have their resolvers called. This is what happens in our case. The schema for our speaker's query defines a return type to either null or an array of speaker type. Internally, GraphQL takes the return value. If it's null, it's returned. Otherwise, if it's an array, the value is iterated over, and a default resolver is called for each speaker field. The parent argument for the resolver is the object at the current loop of the array. Uh, if a resolver for a field returns the wrong type, GraphQL throws an error. Also, if the return type for the initial speaker's query isn't null or an array, we also get an error. The default resolver is one of the great examples of how schemas and resolvers use this building blocks to solve tricky problems like validation. Uh, so a common use case for GraphQL is putting it in front of existing APIs. This is really its bread and butter, what gave it momentum to start off with. But even here, there are some interesting possibilities. Here we've updated our speaker query to make a HTTP request uh, instead of returning a hard-coded array. In the underlying API, your GraphQL schema could have different types than our schema type. In this case, you would just uh, iterate over the JSON and uh, transform it to the type you expect. Once again, we've added the uh, conference resolver to the speaker type. There's a couple of really interesting things happening here. Firstly, we're using both jQuery and Fetch. Because why wouldn't you? We have the entire power of JavaScript and NPM at our disposal in these resolvers. We might as well use it all. Secondly, after the speaker query has made the request to speakers API, we're iterating over the array of speakers, like I said earlier. And for each of those speakers, the conference resolver is then called from an entirely different API. Here, GraphQL is essentially aggregating across multiple APIs in order to resolve a single query. The remaining speaker fields are then resolved using the default resolver. Remember, we can have resolvers on any or all fields. If you wanted to, you could resolve each field by its own API, uh, and users of GraphQL wouldn't, know any, wouldn't be any the wiser. I'm not saying you should do this, but you could if you wanted to. GraphQL got a lot of attention early on because of how well it worked as a facade on top of these fragmented APIs. APIs which often had incompatible methods of authentication, uh, different transport types or content types. Using GraphQL, we could expose a single interface over years of accumulated JSON, XML, REST, SOAP, you have it, APIs, without ever having to rewrite any of them. Uh, it wasn't long before people started extending these ideas, sometimes cutting out the APIs altogether and going straight to the database. Some truly innovative people have gone as far as defining the schemas themselves in the schema different language. Here, we're resolving a speaker query by making a database query. Given what we've this should feel like pretty standard stuff now. We're pulling the database connection off the shared context object. Uh, we set this up earlier. Because you have the full power of JavaScript at your disposal here, you can do all the things you would do in a traditional ORM. And things like switching between reader instances or writer instances, 
uh, or whatever the requirements of that field may be. And if you can use a database, there's no reason you can't use any other kind of data store. Uh, here we're mixing and matching between relational databases, Elasticsearch clusters, and Redis clusters at the field resolver level. Being able to make these operational choices at individual field levels enables us to pick best fit solutions for the requirements of an individual field and changes requirements over time as our systems change. Uh, by no means saying this is unique to GraphQL, uh, simply aiming to illustrate the ease at which these, compat these capabilities are achieved between, with interplay between schemas and resolvers in GraphQL. And this is actually my favorite use case. Uh, I said earlier that the platform's team read bubble. We focus on enabling everyone, not just engineers. And one of the ways we do this is by letting people bring their own tools and adapting our systems to work with them. Enter spreadsheets. Who doesn't love a good spreadsheet? I know I do, our PMs do, our copywriters do, our data scientists do, and the list really just goes on. Uh, spreadsheets are practically ubiquitous, and this makes them a really powerful tool for enabling and encouraging contributions. Uh, Spreadsheets are also fantastic for GraphQL because they're already structured. They come with their own schemas in the form of columns and rows. Here, our speaker's query is loading the speaker spreadsheet from disk, parsing the CSV into JavaScript, and then filtering the speakers in the spreadsheet to just those matching the query, uh, the emoji we passed into the query argument. Now, anyone in our organization can drag and drop a new spreadsheet on the GitHub UI. This kicks off our CI and CD pipelines, and if the tests pass, this new version of the app is deployed to production, and the new data is live for everyone to see. And no engineer was required for this process. Uh, so I mentioned at Redbubble we have, uh, we have a lot of this GraphQL distributed, and we have a lot of configuration services to back these up. Um, and these configuration services are a bit different to other services in that they fetch configuration on deploy and persist locally. They're not meant to be used in request. Uh, and additionally, some of the services may get over-the-wire updates as their lifetime goes on. We like this approach for configuration, but it comes with complexities. Like, what is, the is the configuration stored in memory or on disk? What happens when we receive an update? And then how do we validate the new configuration? We tried a few ways of managing and exposing configurations in our services, and as you might have expected, we eventually landed on GraphQL. Loading configuration files in a resolver is pretty straightforward using the FS Promises API. If we're unable to load the configuration for any reason, the server fails to boot. This works really well in many cloud environments because currently running in deploys will just keep running until new versions can come up, so we don't lose any downtime. Next up, internally, we create a configuration object by querying uh, for that GraphQL configuration. If some important data is missing, or if the data is otherwise unsuitable, the query fails and the service fails to boot again. Here, GraphQL is acting as an internal API, abstracting over the node file system APIs, uh, and also abstracting over the complexities of dealing with configuration validity and freshness. Um, so some of you may have noticed in that previous slide, there's a chicken and egg scenario. Right? How do we load configuration and put it into context if we're loading the configuration inside a resolver? Uh, and this is where we've just been kind of nifty. We create multiple GraphQL servers in one server with their own schemas and resolvers. A server hand one server handles incoming requests and reloads configuration by querying that second GraphQL server. That's right. You can even use GraphQL to abstract over GraphQLs running on the same machine. In fact, just about any API that is simply reads and writes can be represented as GraphQL queries and mutations. Uh, so this is a real light bulb moment for me, and it got me thinking, what if the Node APIs were just GraphQL? Uh, what if our JavaScript APIs were GraphQL? What if all the browser APIs had a GraphQL interface? What if we just GraphQL had everything? Uh, and this is my friends where things go off the rails. Uh, welcome to the don't try this portion at home. Uh, don't try this at home portion of the talk. So I hope by now I've been able to convince you that just about any read or write interface can be like, plastered over with a GraphQL representation. So this got me thinking, the browser has read and write APIs. Surely these could have some GraphQL interfaces. So as it turns out, there's nothing about GraphQL that inherently limits it to server environments. Uh, as long as you have a schema and resolver map, most of the JavaScript GraphQL implementations will happily run in the browser. But why? 
And I think there's a couple of good reasons for this. Uh, we live in a world of like heavy browser feature fragmentation, and even when those features exist, like they're rolled out in a progressive manner with API fragmentation across those features. There's also the complexities of dealing with progressive enhancement, aggressive degradation, and largely just because it's fun. Um, admittedly, I did it for the fun, but I think there's something valuable in the idea of a standard interface across all our web languages. Uh, so let's take a look at some examples. Uh, we've looked at how we use resolvers to interact with data stores, like relational databases and Redis. But the browser has a bunch of its own data stores. We have the web storage APIs and local storage and session storage. We have WebSQL databases, uh, IndexedDB, IndexedDB2, and cookies. And with a bit of creativity, you can stuff any kind of data inside of a URL. Um, there's already a handful of libraries that do this for us, act as a standard interface across a bunch of these uh, 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 storage engines. Um, using a mix of feature detections or polyfills. Uh, and so abstracting over data sources is something GraphQL is already good at. Uh, so it's a really great fit for this scenario. Here we've taken the spreadsheet example from earlier, but instead of reading a file off disk, we're using either the store npm package as an abstraction over various browser storage APIs. Libraries like store will either progressively enhance or gracefully degrade, depending on which APIs are available in the current environment. More importantly, the user of APIs don't need to juggle all the different APIs themselves, nor do they learn a whole new third party API. Uh, they're just looking at the schema for the types required and executing queries and mutations as they already know how to on the server. Just like on the server, the browser has, the browser is equally capable of making network requests to APIs. And just like on the server, we can call the networking APIs within the resolvers. Just like with data stores, we can gracefully degrade depending on what's available in the current operating environment. And that, my friends, is running GraphQL in the browser. I think that's pretty cool. Um, so I thought I'd just end it here. Like, in many ways, browser JS isn't that much different from the server side JS. So it isn't surprising we're able to use GraphQL as an abstraction layer over some finicky APIs. But there are some things unique to the browser. Um, does GraphQL still hold up in this new world? Um, for example, our good old buddy, the DOM. Now, DOM abstraction libraries aren't anything new. Uh, at least some of us here started our JavaScript journeys with things like Dojo, MooTools, Prototype, or jQuery. Um, even newer libraries like React and Vue can largely be looked at as DOM abstraction libraries. Here's a quick example of what a schema might look like to support document.querySelector and document.querySelector role, or the dollar sign function in jQuery. Uh, and this is what the resolvers might look like. We have a document query to get to our document object, and our document type has the DOM APIs we care about as fields. The resolvers for those fields just call methods on the parent, the parent being document in this case. Um, and things are pretty much work as expected. Like, by now, you shouldn't be surprised by anything on this slide. It's just like all the previous examples we've seen before. The question you might have is why? Like, why even do this? Um, and I get it. I was up front. These aren't necessarily good ideas. They're just ideas. But honestly, slides like this, I think, is why. Every time I forget to await my fetch, only to have JavaScript yell at me that I can't use top-level awaits, is why. Every time I forget node lists aren't actually arrays, is why. Every time I decide whether, have to decide whether to use a callback or a promise interface, is why. All the reasons you might still use jQuery today, because it's easier, is why. Something about these slides really speaks to me. But I have to concede, uh, building and maintaining a schema like this for the entirety of the DOM is kind of absurd. Like, I get shivers just thinking about what it would take to maintain. So maybe some enterprising folks could generate schemas and resolvers by scraping things like MDN or W3C specs, or get creative with like a bit of web IDL. Or maybe, what if we just don't have the schema? I know I just spent 20 minutes telling you schemas are amazing, that they're the skeleton of GraphQL. That's all true, but also, I'm really lazy. Like, super lazy. Um, did you see that schema? It's massive, and it's not getting any smaller over time. And so I guess if we don't have schemas, we probably don't need resolvers either. I know, I know, like, they're beating heart of GraphQL, blah, 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 lifeblood, blah, blah, blah. But on the other hand, still very, very lazy. So if you don't have schemas and don't have resolvers, what are you left with? And we're back to our friend, the default resolver. Now, I don't know about you, but if I squint my eyes and tilt my head and use a bit of imagination, this kind of looks like the resolver we had in our uh, DOM APIs. So what if we just define our own default resolver? 
a single resolver that was general enough to handle any field for any DOM API. If it follows a general pattern of fields being properties or functions on their parents, then we don't really need the schema. Like, the DOM is the schema. Like, MDN becomes our schema. I thought it was a nifty idea, so I kind of gave it a shot. Um, I think we've stated enough code on slides, so let's check it out in action. So I have some demos coming up, and I think this stuff is pretty cool, but I've been told it's probably just me. So if you think this stuff is kind of cool, how about giving it a clap so I know to continue? <laughs> All right. So in the interest of time, I have demos prepared earlier. So as I mentioned, we could abstract over things like network requests. So here we're making a request to some random API that someone kindly allowed cause on for me. Uh, and so you can see here, we're just essentially querying for our window object, and on that object, calling fetch. And in fetch, we're just passing an array of arguments that line up to the argument order of the fetch API. So here we're just saying, fetch this URL, and then we're calling the JSON method on that response. So under the covers, you may await this, you may then this, but here you don't have to care about it. It's just taken what is done for you. Um, and here we can see the output, uh, just for the, you know, so you know I'm not lying. Uh, and you can get the result here by calling the path on which we made the, rec which we made the query. So our result, window, fetch, JSON. Uh, so like you may think this is just like, we've already shown how resolvers can make network requests. But this is different, and it's not a resolver making a network request. The query itself is the request. We're resolving how to make requests. Uh, that's a bit, it's a bit unique, I think. Uh, so that's all well and good, but what about the DOM? I promised the DOM. So here, we're em emulating what I talked about earlier. We're, taking the doc we're querying the document. On that document, we're then querying the query selector role and giving it an argument saying what all the p tags. On the resulting p tags, we're pulling properties off. Uh, think of it as like a map. Like we what we've saved here is you don't have to know what this returns. Is it an array? Is it not an array? How do we cast to an array? Can I four of on this thing? Is it going to yell at me? Uh, all those errors you've probably run into like I have. Um, and we can see the output here. We can see the properties coming out. Uh, all right. That's not going to impress you. Let's try this one out. <laughs> so here. We're doing the same thing, except we're using GraphQL aliases. So we're essentially saying, a little bit different here, we're passing a document in, we're saying this is the root, purely for the sake of indentation and readability, but also to show that we can actually operate on the result of something else. So by passing in document, we're now doing three queries of the DOM and actually assigning those results to essentially variables. So here we're saying our good boys are, are querying for all the Doge emojis. Uh, and so, as you might notice, there are some dogs and there are some not dogs here. Uh, we're also querying for the non-doges. And then finally, for the yummy doge. Um, and we can see our output here. Uh, these just show the results of the variables. Um, but to really, hit, to really bring this home, we can actually pass this variable back into another query as the context. And here, we're essentially doing a mutation. We're calling set attribute on that on uh, our first goodest boy. Um, and we're giving it a style and increasing the font size. And if we scroll up, oh, I changed the name. If we scroll up, what? If we scroll up, hey, giant hot dog. <laughs> As you may have guessed, this is the hungry boy. Uh -oh. All, right. All right, so we can query the DOM, we can mutate the DOM. Uh, what else can we do? We can also do animations on the DOM using the Web Animation API. So here, we're getting our hungry boy once again. And then we're using the Web Animation API by calling animate on the resulting thing and giving it the object of the, the Web Animation I expects. So here, we're spinning it and scaling it up and down. Um, and we can change any of these. Like, this is all live. 
Uh, I'm not lying to you. This is like, so here, we've had to, all we've had to do is look at MDN, find the API, and it's the same query interface. We didn't care what it returned or how it worked. Uh, but so what if we want to reuse the, what if we want to reuse the animation? How do we copy the animation around and reuse it? And here we can use things like GraphQL fragments. Here, we're querying two different DOM nodes in our yummy boy and our non-dogs. Um, and we're giving two different animations. We're giving a spin animation and a bounce animation. And these are just defined down here as fragments on the element type. Uh, we have one that bounces and one that spins, uh, and they're named as such. So if we uncomment this, whoa. Ah. Animations as variables. Oh, that's the best I got, I'm sorry. <laughs> But I know some of you are thinking, DOM. Who uses the DOM? I'm all about that jQuery life. And for you, we have this. We're passing our jQuery as the root context, and now we can just call jQuery as normal. We're doing our request for the item, and we're calling the animate function. And now we're animating CSS properties the way you would in jQuery. Uh, and these can all be used together. There is no limit to the hilarity that can ensue with enough animations. So let's give this one more spin before I wrap up. And there we go. GraphQL on the DOM in the browser. Um, uh, so in closing, I started by saying GraphQL's superpower is how it took a couple of really simple ideas and schemas and resolvers and shaped everything else to look like a schema and a resolver. Uh, this resolvers all the way down design I think is pretty fantastic makes GraphQL infinitely versatile. So maybe with a little creativity, we can GraphQL all the things and move towards a universal query language for the web. Uh, thank you.